Uh, so to get started, um, I'm going to try to get rid of some of this stuff on my screen. I hate how Zoom makes you have all these random boxes. Can I minimize this? Yeah. There we go. Thanks uh, for waiting with me for that. So about a little bit about me. Um, I've been working with the uh, LibreText people for about a decade now, um, and I've participated in a number of one of the a number of these uh, workshops, both in person and online. Um, I have been an instructor at Syntec Lusk University, a uh, travel reservation in South Dakota. Um, I went to graduate school at UW Madison. I've been a uh, professor at the University of Virgin Islands at HBCU and at Hope College, a private school. Um, and right now I am the OER lab library curator for Catalyst Education, uh, a company that makes LabFlow. And I've done a lot of work with online digital libraries, uh, which is how I actually met Bob, who was just chatting. Uh, on the right there, that's my office in uh, the travel reservation and also my office down in the Virgin Islands. So if you want to ask random questions later about living all over the place, feel free to do so. But all these things just give me some background into working with very diverse groups of students and different sizes of schools. Um, and that led me to how, uh, in, uh, how I'm currently very involved in open educational resources uh, and accessibility of, from students of all backgrounds and school sizes, uh, which is why I'm here and what I really got into in my PhD work. So the emphasis, a lot of my research has been in how do students get information and, and incorporate that in their own mind. So, for instance, we're all pretty familiar with lectures um, and textbooks or lab manuals. We're also pretty familiar with regular books that people would be reading. Uh, but also, I want to keep in mind that we're using the internet. So think about where you get information from the internet. For instance, news uh, websites or other uh, Reddit type of things that you look at. For instance, these days, there's everything from Twitter to Facebook, Reddit. People are getting things on TikTok. I'm not entirely sure what that is. Even I'm too old for that. Uh, and of course, there's YouTube. We're all here on Zoom right now. How are we interacting with the society around us in order to uh, get information in order for us to put it into our brains? Um, and how do we assimilate that? So the thing, learning online really is different. And that's kind of one of the main goals of this talk is just to rethink about how we accept knowledge into our brain in order to learn. Uh, so gaining understanding from textbook, that's pretty simple. We're pretty used to this. In fact, one thing I like to emphasize is that if I'm dealing with academics, we were pretty good at learning from textbooks. That's why we got where we are, because we were able to figure out how to get information from a textbook. I'm not saying that's a bad skill to have, but it's definitely the one that not everybody has. And remember, I'm, I'm more interested in accessibility for all students, not necessarily just the ones that can adapt in certain situations. So we're used to chapters and units and sections. Uh, we're also used to things that are not as quite uh, vocalized when we talk about books. For instance, they might have a story or a narration through a chapter. There's a certain consistency of voice across a textbook and how things are explained in the vocab that are used. Uh, there's also usually little tidbits in books that have to do with motivation of why you'd want to learn this material, examples or example problems about how you would use the material, and the textbook should try its best to make connections from one part of the textbook to another. Our knowledge is inherently interlinked. It's filled with connections between different areas. Uh, so the textbooks are pretty powerful, but like I said, are they really what every one of our students are using is the most accessible way to give information to students. Um, and this has been studied over and over and over again through the years. The paper in the bottom right there is from Eastern Michigan, and it's from 1975. Um, and in 1975, they actually did a really interesting study where they took a dab of glue and glued every single textbook page together. And it, while students were taking their tests or quizzes, they would count how many glue pages had been broken. So they would literally count how many times a book was even open to a page. Uh, in between exams. Uh, the data was not too great. You'll find that most students only opened on average about two to three pages um, for each of the chapters that were involved in this textbook. So people are just really not opening much. And obviously they're not doing a lot of opening of new pages right before exams because they hopefully are reviewing stuff they've already opened. So there's that, that, there's that dip there. 
but on average, still two to three pages. And if you look across this in chapter, if it's a 16 chapter book, then you would think 16 times three is not how long that book is. You would assume it's a lot longer than that, which means students really are not. Even 1975, when everything was better back then and everyone knew how to use a textbook, people still weren't using it. I read a lot of this work using online textbooks uh, in 2011 at a large university. Um, and I had three sections. Sections one and two were using a hard copy textbook. Section three was using an online textbook. And uh, as you'd expect up here, sections one and two mostly using on the hard copy textbook. Section three was only using the online one. So people were at least self-reporting what they were assigned to use. People use what they're assigned. Uh, how much did you use another textbook? It's a very common thing for faculty, especially in the sciences, but also I think uh, in a lot of fields that use textbooks and not just regular books uh, to say, hey, here's the book you're assigned and required to read, but the library has unreserved this book, that book, that book. Nobody uses those. Okay. Uh, the one on the bottom here changed. This is a big one, especially for people who are invested in teaching uh, subjects that really have a lot of multimedia involvement, uh, representations, multiple colors, videos. Back in the day, it would be more CD-ROMs. Now it would be online materials. I asked the students if they're ever touching the CD-ROM or the website that was assigned in the textbook, referred to in the textbook, and was referred to in homework questions. And as you can see, it doesn't matter if they're using the hard copy textbook or the online textbook, they did not use it. So all that extra effort and really fancy things that students are using, or are told to use and that you might have chosen your textbook because they had good resources, students don't touch them. That's a pretty consistent thing. Over here, the Kempass textbook, people are using the hard cop, uh, are actually using the book that they are assigned. And how often do they use it? Hmm, fairly regularly to very much not at all. It's really quite across the board whether students are using it or not. So um, that's not gonna, yes. that's not gonna change. Did someone have a question? Okay, I just heard some noise. All right. So, uh, people. Uh, people. And I Anna, you might want to mute your mic. Me? That would be bad. Thanks, Anna. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, some things that are worth thinking about back in the day, 2011, so this is over 10 years ago, where are people using textbooks? They're using them in the library, they're using it at home. Uh, and that doesn't really change whether you're using online or in person, or sorry, hard copy. So this is really just kind of get to the point of, uh, people are going to have pretty similar habits, no matter what. The one difference you'll notice is that people use a hard copy more often in a lab. And if you happen to work in a chemistry lab, you'll probably know why. Uh, especially 10 years ago, electronics just really weren't allowed in the lab. Um, that's come a long way since then. But other than that, if you're worried about whether your students are going to use things in the similar locations, they're going to. It's very, very similar across the group you're at. Uh, so why would we want to move to an online textbook? I think we are all here because we agreed that it's probably a good idea. Uh, and probably we're all here for the same uh, logical Conclusion, which is that textbooks are just getting to be far too expensive. This was back in 20, uh, I think 15 is when this was coming out. Um, either way, this is 812% more expensive compared to the, uh, to the baseline. So everything in terms of college textbooks are just getting to be far too expensive. Um, and a lot of times, especially if you're teaching an introductory level or a general education course, the difference between one textbook and another is really not that large. Uh, and it's all information that's been around for decades. Um, so it's really easy for us to come up with better ways to do it and share our resources together, which is really what the Libre uh, universe is all about. Um, and then we have the pandemic. So a lot of people prior to the pandemic would have arguments that were um, valid and from ex years of experience. And then after the pandemic, they realized they had to, we were forced to try new experiences. So uh, how do our students interacting with information now? Uh, flipped learning has become a thing that's a lot more common. Uh, people are beginning to record their own lectures more often, uh, trying to involve more interactivity. So that goes along with flipped learning. Are you trying to use your classroom time to actually engage students with each other because they don't get that chance outside of class anymore? Um, 
making sure that they can facilitate online discussions. Uh, and also modularization has changed. So we're no longer saying, you know, this is test one material. Oftentimes we'll break things down into smaller modules because it's easier to think about that in terms of an online mediated uh, experience. So a lot of these things have changed uh, since the pandemic. And this is where I normally would just take a few minutes to um, have people talk. So I'm just gonna have a minute here where you can think for a second. And I want you to think about the ways you are expecting students to interact with the information in your course and how that's changed in the last two years. So I think it's important for us to think about it for a minute. All right. Um, I hope that that gave you some insight into just thinking about how things have changed, uh, possibly for the better. Maybe there are some things you really, really do like more about your course now uh, than you did before. And I think that's valuable thinking about moving forward and thinking about textbooks. So before I get into the details of how to think about building an online text or how to evaluate an online text, uh, I want to reemphasize what Bob said, which is, the majority of the stuff in this talk is for everyone, uh, regardless of your field. I am a chemistry education researcher, so it is my natural role to integrate chemistry education research into uh, my uh, process as much as possible. Uh, but I'm going to make it really clear with either red boxes or red outlines, the parts that really are for everybody and were taken from general education research materials. Um, and then I'll highlight what things really come from discipline-based education research. Uh, and that's not to say that can't be applied to your area. Very likely, if you're doing something very visual in your field, engineering, physics, biology, then a lot of the chemistry education stuff will apply there as well. Um, but it also means that then you'll know what to go look for when you go into your own field. If you want to think about, hey, I need to go ask my education researcher in English how to approach this type of a project, then you'll have a better way to incorporate into how you're thinking about building your textbooks. So uh, back to what I'm talking about, what I was talking about before in terms of finding that source of truth. And this is a really interesting phenomenological study by uh, Dr. Sandy Urena. And he went in and did some interviews with students and asked them from a chemistry lab, where do you students in lab turn to find an answer. So this is a real in-person experience. They are in the process of doing some exercise involving chemistry. They hit a wall, they're not sure what to do. Where do they go to find the right answer? Um, and so this is kind of nice because it's a actual real life problem, right? And faculty aren't often around for real life problems because they're not there when someone's writing a paper or doing the library research. So in chemistry, we can actually see what they're working on. And they have a couple options. Uh, some students will start using the manual or looking at the text. So they will ignore what the professor said, they'll ignore their notes, they'll go straight to that manual and reread that step over and over again. Uh, or they'll go with each other. I think everyone across all the disciplines have experienced a time where all the students have Whoa, started to believe the wrong thing. Uh, this is usually because there's one vocal minority student uh, who hasn't come prepared, but likes to sound prepared and manages to convince everybody uh, that their minority opinion is the majority opinion and convinces everyone. And of course, by, by minority, I mean not where the manual says, not what the instructor says, not what anyone else has said. They have their own opinion. Uh, and then all the class suddenly is doing the wrong thing. Uh, possibly they go to the TA. This is more important from a uh, large school standpoint because a loss and oftentimes the TA is a grad student who has done the lab before and might know what to do, uh, whereas their instructor doesn't teach the lab. They only teach the lecture, so they might say something in class that is actually wrong about the lab, so that becomes the source of truth for that student is actually the TA, not the instructor of the course. Um, or very possibly it is the instructor and not the TA. This might happen at smaller schools where there's an undergraduate TA with a instructor 
that is in the room with them and knows more about the lab. So figuring out where students actually find where the truth is, is important, but it also is important for us as faculty to think about where do we want them to go first. Um, my graduate school advisor and I would frequently have conversations because he was at a very large institution and spent most of his life at a very large institution. So his role was, I have 400 students, I'm going to give five or six different ways for them to find the same answer and consistency was the most important thing for him. And I'm not saying that's bad, uh, but I was from a smaller school. So I prefer giving people one path because when they're in lab, I want them to go to the manual, ignore their TA and often their instructor and go to that manual and do what the manual says. So then it became a way of trying to think about how did we want to approach our different groups of students uh, in order to facilitate best. Should they all be linked up? Should they be multimodal? And oftentimes it's best to just get to know your students and the different backgrounds that they have. So when you're online, how do you find that truth or how do you direct students to the correct, correct place or the source of truth for this? Um, and for this, I'd like to give a, a story from when I lived in the Virgin Islands. This is the island of St. Thomas. Um, and on the left, you can see the roads kind of go around in different angles. They're interconnected, there's random dead ends. Uh, and because of that, the road system there really doesn't use names at all. A couple of the biggest tourist roads will have like symbols just to let them know where they're going to watch beach and all that. But for the most part, every single house in this area is all some number Moffley because Moffley is the name of that area. So you can have a house number that's right identical next to you, right behind you, but it's actually three roads away, but it's the same uh, sequential order. So that makes giving directions really hard. So what the most common thing to do is to use landscapes. And this is something that I'm not coming up with. This is very applicable to online learning. This is how people give directions generally. Uh, so what the people would say is they would say, go up that road behind the Kmart, up to the top of the hill to the four-way stop where the big tree used to be before Hurricane Marilyn. Um, Hurricane Marilyn was in the 80s, which was when I was a child. I did not live in the Virgin Islands then. Uh, so I actually had to get to know where the intersection was that people were referring to when I had never seen a tree that was the reference point. But by the end of my couple of years there, I was using the same directions saying, just go up the road, go to the intersection where the big tree was before Hurricane Maryland and take a right. Uh, and that worked. So giving those landscape pivotal points for how to find directions uh, works in many instances in the real world. And it's the same thing that you would find online. So online world has gotten to be more and more condensed and more symbolic. So everyone knows this little hamburger in the corner means that's the menu. If you need to find something in the menu, go there, that'll give you navigation in general. Over here, if you need to set up anything to do with the settings for this page or your course, there's that gear icon. Those are landmarks that we use to navigate to find these, these places. Our account information is always by our name. And we have this thing that we call breadcrumbs across the top. And the breadcrumbs give you a path of where you're located. So basically this can feel kind of like the name of the book, the unit that you're in, the section you're in. Uh, it's very similar to how a book might be structured, but we're not uh, using it in the same way. It's a different way to present the same sort of navigational and grounding that a student would need in order to know where they're at and how things are connected together and where to go to find that truth. So you need to think about that when you're building your courses instead of just page two goes to page three. So framework for design uh, and where I believe Bob sent you to a link uh, to some materials for how to design a textbook. And a lot of the information is here, uh, is also in that area. If not, then uh, can someone send that link on there um, so we can have it or possibly post it to the forum. That'd probably be even better because then you have it later. Uh, a lot of the work that I've done in my past is trying to come up with frameworks for design. So a framework, if you're not familiar with it, is a guiding principle behind understanding how to design or think about a teaching material. So it's the why behind how you're going to build something. Um, this uh, framework here, I call the content architecture and pedagogy or the, the CAP. Um, and that is a design framework for how to approach designing your own online teaching materials. Um, and what I want to emphasize at this point is just hopefully you already agree with me that putting a PDF of a textbook online undermines all the pedagogical advantages that a hypertext online medium has to enhance student learning. 
So there's a lot of things that you can do about navigation, sources of truth that can enhance a student's experience um, if they're done properly and how you think about them as different than a regular textbook. Uh, and in the box below, everything to do with architecture is uh, completely applicable to all different mediums. And actually a lot of the other materials I'm gonna show you uh, are as well. Obviously the content, which is uh, that circle in the upper left-hand corner is gonna be really specific to your discipline itself. And sometimes the pedagogy is going to be as well. One thing I like to point out about this picture, it's a nice Venn diagram and you'll see that there's uh, six little box subsets there that point out different areas and there are seven areas. So the area on the bottom there, pedagogy, pedagogy alone doesn't exist. You cannot think about how to teach without thinking about how you're going to teach it, which would be the architecture, your order, your design, your structure, or the content that you're going to teach. Pedagogy really doesn't exist outside of that when you're talking about a textbook, right? So if you're talking about a textbook itself, then you need to have content to work with or you have to have architecture to work with or the design and structure of that material. So to go on a couple things I wanna point out, one really big one is that, yes, I said architecture is going to be everything that everyone can use, but really a lot of the content stuff I'm gonna talk about is also relevant to everybody. Um, it's usually when you get to the pedagogy of how to teach something that your discipline-based education uh, colleagues will be able to help you the most. Um, so for accessibility, this one is really important to think about in terms of scaffolding. How are you going to make your material accessible? And this is not accessibility for um, alt texts and uh, visually impaired students. That's extremely important. And actually Libre, uh, the Libre text library has a ton of tools that already exist for that. I'm talking about accessibility in terms of how do students access the material? How do they go to find it? Uh, so making sure that things are shared in the appropriate way. So are all the pages visible? Have they all been published? Are they scaffolded correctly? Like how have you thought about whether they should learn this before that? Uh, but at the same time, you don't wanna make students afraid to go and explore other things. So is, it, is there abilities for them to go one step deeper if they want to, or find something that's akin to it? Uh, retrievability is a kind of a basic thing. Can students go back and get it when they need a specific thing instead of going through it in, 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 uh, in an order, right? So if you always have to go through, start at page one and go up to page 100, there's no other way to jump straight to 100. That's not very retrievable. Uh, transparency. This is really important, I think, uh, because you don't have a book in front of you. What is all covered? Right. So what is the things that are all material, all the material that are needed for a given quiz or a given test or a course? What are your learning objectives? That transparency of the course is really important. Um, and orientability, this is more to do with that landmark, right? How do students figure out where they are within your material and where they might need to go forward or back to either understand something that they um, were supposed to know before that point and might need to review, or how do they go forward onto the next step? So making sure that they can figure out where they are within your course structure is important. And that's all material that's all about just the architecture of how you build your course. It has nothing to do with the content at this point. Uh, the content um, is extremely important and it's mostly not changed from a hard copy textbook. And when I say that, I mean, the things you're teaching should really not be different, right? Um, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of details about that because you're all teaching different courses and they all look really exciting from what I've looked at so far. Uh, but I don't want you to ever think that content should be thought of as independent from how it is taught or organized, right? So you're not teaching a bullet list chunk of facts. If that was true, to be honest, I'm not sure that anyone should pay to go take a class. Um, if it's just a list of facts that need to be memorized, give them the list of facts and then have them go and take a test. Um, so why we're going to organize it or how we're going to teach it should influence how you're organizing that content. Um, how you're teaching it, that is the pedagogy. How it's organized within an online textbook, it's the architecture. So that's where those two things come. Some things to think about when you're thinking about the content that you're going to have, what is usable by the students? And that can go into the other version of accessibility. In other words, don't include a bunch of things that your uh, visually impaired students can't use. Um, what are you going to be able to use legally? 
So we're going to have something later on in the uh, Libre Fest that talks about uh, copyright and things like that. Um, what's attributable? So what things do you need to use that you should attribute to either colleagues in your field or to the original author of that material? Um, and where can you take those things from freely so that we have access to them? Uh, and uh, there's a ton of things of the remixer that we'll get into at this workshop that uh, you'll get to see. There's a ton of things out there you can take, borrow, use, um, put in different orders. What role do links take? This is, I think, a very important one as you start to build more architecture. Uh, I did a lot of studies with my research students into whether or not people click on links. So if you're reading Wikipedia and let's say the word um, independent here was highlighted with a link and an underline, it would take you to another page. Students do not use those. Um, I think that the percentage of students that touched any of those was well below one hundredth of one percent. Um, of users ever clicked on one of those. Um, if you actually think something's super important and students should possibly think about clicking that link. So I'm not saying that they all need to click that link. If they need to click that link, it should be part of your architecture and structure of how you build your course. But if you think a good number of students might be interested in it or it might help a good number of your students, then essentially pretend like it's a necessary thing. Say, if you wanted to learn more about this or um, if you don't understand uh, this background material, click here or use this link or go here. Being very explicit about that, especially if it's written by a professor in a professor's own book, so not in like an online book from some other company, but one that a professor has actually edited and built and put some of their own words into it, students actually use those. Uh, again, not all of them, but it's upwards closer to 20% of the students might click on that link. Uh, so what role are your links going to have in your course and how are you going to use those to make sure students get built in there? For architecture and pedagogy, uh, this material here is mostly what you'd get from your discipline-based education researcher, but there's some key things that everyone can take from that. Um, make sure that an individual page has a layout that contributes effect to effective learning. So how do you put your pictures next to your page, uh, your text? How do you number things? Uh, how do you give captions? How do you alt text? Um, how are you going to organize the units, the weeks or days uh, that can have their own effective architecture? So we don't have to do units, sections, chapters anymore or, um, or just chapters or anything like that. We wanna make pages as small and concise as possible so they're modular. And we also wanna make the chunks that we're going to put those pages into in a way that reflects what you're really thinking is important and get, contributes to transparency for your course. And we'll give some examples of that in a few minutes. The course as a whole can have its own architecture to lower cognitive load. This is, I think, one that's really a great improvement to using LibreText over a lot of other options because almost everyone, at least I know in the math and sciences, but I think it probably applies a lot of other areas as well. If you have a course that has a textbook, you choose a textbook from a publisher that covers things in a way that you like, but often covers way more than you would like. It might have 30 chapters and you're only going to cover 20 of them in your course. On LibreText, that's not true. Only put the chapters in that are necessary. Uh, if you need background material, that's great. Your students are a little weaker on average in algebra than most other institutions. Not a problem. You can put in some of those uh, algebra links to other sites there on the Libre text to give them the extra help that they might need. Um, or if you have a class that has a lot of high achievers and really care about medical school, then maybe you'll have some more resources that you want to leak out to that deal with the medical profession or things like that. So making a course as a whole to have that architecture that really supports your students isn't just about making things nicer or cleaner or organized. It can lower the cognitive load of your students. And when you lower the cognitive load, that makes it easier for students to focus on using their available cognitive load to learn the material they should be learning instead of just figuring out what it is that they need to learn. So within chemistry education, just as an example of this, um, then the bottom there, there's actually a paper out there from Yu Wu and Sha that has five design principles to guide development. And I would encourage you to reach out to your own disciplinary education researchers in your field to get some idea about what are these sorts of things that um, probably already exist that can help you to teach certain things? So for instance, the big one that you might notice there is uh, 2D to 3D um, 
and various skills. Those sorts of things are really important to chemistry and it's things that we focus on as a, as a learning objective. So that's something that I use there to facilitate design in my chemistry textbook, but feeds right into this idea of uh, transitions and linking things and reducing cognitive load. A lot of these things you'll see keep coming up because although I talked about them within chemistry, they are also important in general to how you just teach in general. Um, and there's a lot of there's a lot of overlap there. Some things that are really really important in general, if you happen to have a lot of text, uh, sorry, images, uh, making sure that images don't float is a really important thing that I think faculty frequently, well, not faculty, but a lot of authors will frequently forget. They'll add a picture because it's really nice, and they will believe that the picture is self-explanatory why it links with whatever they just talked about in the text. But you should make sure that the text directly references images because students are going to read and then they might go look at the pictures or maybe they'll look at the pictures and then read. So you can't assume they're gonna have that author's understanding of how those things are linked inherently and they're not necessarily gonna go back and forth between the two while they're reading. Multimedia must be complementary, not redundant. So this is a, the best, the best example of this that I can think of is think of a news article where you look and you scroll through and there are random quotes that are actually just duplicated larger versions of quotes that are already in the text. That's redundant and it might be good for clickbait, but we're not looking for clickbait really. Uh, we're looking for things that are easy and transparent to go and find that information. So you can say, you know, read question, equation five and then only have equation five there in the box. Uh, you don't need to repeat that multiple places, especially for multimedia. You wanna make sure that's complementary to the text that's in there. Uh, think about uh, think beyond the textbook as far as potential material could be linked. One good thing about the online world is that you can link to other libraries. So you could be in physics and link to math or be in biology and link to like, genetics. Um, and those things can all be linked together. Although I will say that within LibreText, this is better handled by remixing your own textbook, especially if it's something that you want everybody to go to anyway. Just make that part of your scaffolded structure. Uh, and the one other thing I want to point out from this is the inherent difference of working in the hypertext world. So hypertext world just means that things that are linked together, uh, you can jump from place to place much more easily, which means you can give people better ways to go back and review things. So maybe how you want them to go through the material when they're learning it will be different than how you want them to review it and giving them different access tools for that is different than using a hard, line, hard copy textbook. Um, as speaking from a professional in the world of getting faculty to think about using online course management systems, one of the largest jumps that I've had to do is convincing faculty that page numbers just aren't good anymore. Um, it's not the best thing to do to think that you have one book that starts at page one and then just reference everything by a page number. That's how we're used to doing it, but that's a bad thing to do if you happen to insert one page because you insert one page between fall and spring and then you have to renumber everything else from that page on. And that means going back and finding every place you reference that page number and fixing it. That takes a tremendous amount of time. So coming up with better ways to link things together that aren't based on a hard copy frame of mind is really important. So some examples of using this whole entire framework that we've done, I'm actually gonna come back to this uh, a little bit later, is uh, trying to build a Libre text textbook that might have an interface for it that looks like a traditional textbook. So this would be probably the similar, most similar one to what you're used to. There's a chapter, it's got sections. Sections aren't necessarily numbered one, two, three. They don't have to be, you can do it though. It might make it easier for you. Um, but you can also have links to other resources. So these are outside of Libre Text. There may be demos or uh, interactive simulations that you want to use with that system. So you have this nice little structure. That is the simplest, easiest way to do it. Uh, or you could design your course so that the table of contents is actually a list of lectures along with assigned readings for each day and maybe the assigned worksheets for each day. That way students know what material should be prepared for for that given lecture. You've made that cognitive load lower so that students don't have to think about where they might need to go. Having a syllabus that tells them what pages to read and go back and forth between those, that's adding another hurdle to trying to figure out what they need to get done uh, when they're 
maybe not sitting by the, your hard copy copy textbook. This text here at Howard uh, combines a lot of them. So if a student needs to go and access material, they might go different ways. So if they're preparing for a lecture, they might go to the agenda and see a page that looks like this. So I'm preparing for lecture two. That means I'm gonna click on these two links and take a look at that worksheet. I've gotten to the material I need for that day quickly and I know exactly what scope I need to prepare for. I might just need to go see if I've got my homework done or I made a note to myself, I need to go do a homework. So this homework page here will link back to those same worksheets possibly or to another system or to other resources. Uh, so that's if you wanted to go and make sure that. Uh, lecture slideshows, there's a very good chance that these are the same things that are linked to in the agenda, but they wanna go back review for a test. So they might do that. If they wanna go look at the textbook, unit one has everything to review that is in uh, exam one. So just like before, this is a good way to approach the material for day-to-day -day learning, but they might not need to go back and review atomic mass, but they might need to go back and review the nuclear atom. So as long as they can go to this unit one, they can see all the sections that are necessary for that test and then navigate that way. So this is a way to organize that same material in a different way. And again, both of these can be used at the same time. Um, another method that uh, Delmar has actually used in his course, which I really like, and I like to think that he's uh, grown and built things better and cleaner and nicer along the way as he gets feedback from his students. Um, and this ends up hitting on a lot of things I really appreciate about online materials. Here, he has his same lecture outline with essentially the learning objective or the material that's supposed to be covered and learned in that, that class. This adds to the ability to have a review sheet but also to know what's coming and to be transparent about what's needed for that class. It has the necessary readings, has the homework that will be required, any worksheets they can do on their own. It also has any assumed knowledge. So this is stuff that may not be required, uh, might not be a learning objective for this course, but it was a learning objective for a prior course and is assumed that you already know it. Uh, but students can go back and take a look at that. So this gives that a different type of, and I wouldn't even call this one an agenda. This is really a course structure here. Um, it's almost a syllabus, to be honest. Uh, and you can include other things that you might want. For instance, you might want to include local news. If your news is only linked to on one page, instead of being with that throughout the text at all different points, I can tell you that makes link checking a lot easier to make sure that uh, some news article doesn't get moved or changed on you from one semester to the next. It's pretty quick to go through and just click on those if you know where they all are. Um, so another way that we actually implement this at my own company at LabFlow, which we design online laboratory materials for chemistry. Um, and most of our stuff is research-based. Three out of the four owners of the company are chemistry people who have taught at university. Two out of four of the owners have uh, PhDs in discipline-based education, research, and chemistry. Uh, so a lot of the things that you just saw that were in the, the news, we've actually kind of implemented ourselves. So I'm very familiar with how to do this. Um, we have each of our weeks are organized this way and students can either look at it as a list or they can look at a card view. This is what the card view looks like. The different pictures there actually represent what the students will be doing, on, working on. Uh, so that gives a visual way of looking at materials as well. Um, and that's worked out really well and students tend to really give us positive feedback. Um, if you're if you are a chemist or a biologist and you're interested in that, let me know um, and I can walk you through any of those things or get you in contact with them. Um, because there's a lot of really interesting stuff that's going on in that field. Uh, so some content specific thoughts that you might need to think about moving forward, the things that we really can't help you with uh, at the Libre Fest, but you'll wanna look into. And that's just because we're not subject matter experts or DBR uh, experts in all the different fields. And that is, like I said before, the content that you might wanna teach. So how are you going to teach that material? What is the best way to teach it? For instance, in chemistry, that would be the use of multiple representations. Whenever you teach a subject, don't use only letters, make sure you use balls and sticks and all that kind of material. Um, and the pedagogy and how the pedagogy overlaps with the content. So that's that how you teach something. What are you trying to teach? How are you trying to teach it? Really uh, reach out to colleagues of yours or look at the literature in those areas. There's a lot of it out there. Um, and that's where you'll really have to think about how you're gonna run your course but you can think about the architecture and how that's gonna overlap with your um, content uh, in how you're gonna structure things at this fest, uh, Libre Fest. 
Um, oh, just a really quick highlight. Uh, we're not just a place that designs really cool lab experiments for chemistry and biology. We're also an OER library. So if you happen to be in chemistry or biology, um, there's a link up there that goes to our OER library. All of our labs are free, open to use. Uh, we sell the software that helps you teach them. We don't sell the labs. So if you want really well tested laboratories um, and experiments that are available, those are all there. They're in the process of moving over, not moving over, but being duplicated at the library uh, within Libre within the Libre Text Library uh, right now, um, and OpenStax as well. So uh, they're things we're sharing broadly for people to be able to use, um, based on the fact that we have forty thousand students a semester. Uh, work with us um, testing out these labs for us really um, we have a lot of cool things i'm going to skip over a lot of it but uh in case anyone happens to be curious it's based on this kind of structure that we found in the education research uh, this is also by michael siri who i was cited earlier um, in how to build pre-lab in lab and assessment for effective dimension dimensions these sorts of things can be reflected in the structure of a course that you're designing uh, straight from the research into something that's flexible to use. Um, and actually I actually showed that tile. So a quick little recap. I encourage you to go reach out for the DBR people, but also uh, getting started with a designing line, online textbook. It's thinking about mostly the content and the architecture that you're gonna be covering. So uh, some questions to ask yourself as you're getting started this uh, festival. What are your learning objectives for the course? How many are you teaching in a given lecture or a given exam period? What conceptual links between material are important for your students to understand? What depth does a concept need to be covered? How are you going to assess that content? And how many sample problems, for instance, should be included? So those are the types of questions you can ask yourself as you're designing a page, a unit, or a course. Um, for architecture, some questions to ask yourself, how many learning objectives will you put on a single page? Uh, so that might be different than how many you're gonna put in a lecture. Uh, if things are connected, should they be covered at the same time or on multiple pages, or maybe you should hyperlink them in some way. How integrated do you want your syllabus to be? Do you want to use an online course manager? Do you want that to be your syllabus? Like I said before, that last example from Delmar, really could be a course syllabus. It covers the material that needed to be done, what work needs to get done, and how it's going to be assessed. Uh, how integrated do you want your syllabus? Oh, sorry, I just read that one. How do you organize a page of information? So that goes back to possibly looking at uh, how you're going to talk about the images or multimedia that are either linked to or embedded in the page or the equations that you're looking at. Um, and are you including something because it can be included or because it helps learning? This is one that uh, I would highly recommend you ask yourself after the first day. So it is exciting to put things into your course and you might find it really cool to grab this picture and that picture and this video, um, but we wanna make sure to reduce that cognitive load. So just because you can put it on a page, is it always beneficial to your students to have it in the page? Possibly multiple resources for the same learning objective might be just increasing the cognitive load of, for a student approaching that material for the first time. So with that, I wanted to thank you and ask for any questions, which we do have a few minutes. I do have only one screen, so I'm literally staring at the thank you. Any questions? So you might have something you can ask. The, about <laughs> the laboratory thing that you said, uh, it, you said it is available on Library Fest, and are the actual experiments available over there in the video form or something like that? Uh, the experiment, the, the manual PDFs of the background material, the learning objectives, the equipment lists, and uh, the procedures that you would use are all freely available. Uh, it has some assessment questions, not all of them. Some of the assessment questions are proprietary and used by, you know, we, we don't want to have too many questions duplicated everywhere because that just makes it hard to keep them off of cheating websites, to be honest. Um, but the procedures are there, uh, the amounts are there, all that kind of stuff is everything there. Yep. 
recorded video or simulations also there? Uh, no simulations. Um, and we do have videos, but they're mostly pre-lab videos. We, we don't do a lot. We don't, we're not an online uh, simulation company. We are an online lab preparation and, and report company. So students prepare by watching our, our videos, our quiz, do our quizzes, um, and then do the reports online, which are auto graded. Um, but we're, we're not a, an, an online simulation company at all. But, so the videos we have are meant to be watched by our students that use our software um, in preparation for lab. Those aren't included in the OER. Uh, what's concluded in the, uh, the online free access stuff is just the, the manual PDF that describes the experiment, gives the background, has the images that are necessary to prepare. Um, so basically it's what you'd get if you were to go to a publisher and buy a lab manual hard copy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so earlier on in your presentation, Justin, you had indicated uh, the uh, the very large inflation of the cost of textbooks, and that sparked a lot of uh, discussion in the chat that I wanted to uh, tag us back to because it seemed like a very important uh, topic, and maybe Justin, you can speak on it, but maybe Delmar as well. Uh, you know, what is driving the cost, that increased cost of textbooks? Um, and feelings about the relative importance of that cost of the textbooks in comparison to the cost of the tuition and how, you know, different uh, types of universities might feel about the cost of textbooks. I think, uh, <clears throat> Del, are you still giving your talk about like the history of the Libre texts? Um, I'm not gonna be doing the history per se, but uh, I can certainly discuss it. Uh, if there's a specific aspect you're interested in. No, I, you, you do a well, a good job of explaining why you got into this in the first place. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I, I think I, that's gonna be in there. Um, I can address, but I can, I could probably, let, let, let me address that question if I can. Sure. Um, <clears throat> there are lots of reasons why people should be pursuing OER uh, and costs is one of the convenient ways in order to be able to address it. And, and it's true that costs are an issue. Um, however, uh, I oftentimes have to emphasize that uh, we are educators, at least I presume almost everyone in here is an educator. Um, and, and the most important aspect of uh, our interests in pursuing OER is for the benefit of our educational mission. Uh, <clears throat> Um, another way in order to say this is that uh, we're funded primarily by the U.S. Department of Education, not by the U.S. Department of Commerce. So the costs associated with the textbook, I have strong philosophical and internal issues associated with that and gouging and all the things like that that I will mention uh, in a moment. Um, but the key point is that it's critical aspect uh, is the fact that the cost of the textbook is impairing our educational mission because students if given the opportunity, uh, uh, will uh, curb their expenses on purchasing textbooks uh, for other things of particularly greater importance, like rent or food or other issues that are particularly uh, important. Uh, <clears throat> they don't do that for tuition because they need the tuition in order to get the credit of what's going on here. So in other words, they identify what is the minimum they can do in order to be able to go through when they have limited financial aspects. Uh, and that right there is one of the key aspects that we uh, address by making everything free uh, that's out there. There are solutions in order to try to fold that into tuition via equitable access or inclusive access. Uh, and there's lots of uh, issues uh, with those programs. There's also unfortunately a lot of propaganda that's being pushed in the community regarding those programs because they're not 100% evil. Um, so there's a lot of complexity behind uh, that question. And we can certainly talk about it in more detail, but I don't think we have enough time right now. And I really do want to give you guys a little bit of a break before you listen to me, um, because typically people need a break be between the Justin Delmar combination uh, for some reason. Or other. He's the left punch and I'm the right punch. Um, so. Oh, I was going to say good cop, bad cop. But <laughs> <laughs>